everyone, you're watching Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch and I'm Pragya. Today we have three different stories which are the United Nations finally thrashing out a treaty to keep 30% of the high seas safe for ocean life. We next look at West African nations forging new ties with each other after French military exits from Mali and Burkina Faso. And tennis star Novak Djokovic loses his bid for a COVID-19 vaccine waiver in the United States. On Saturday, UN members signed off on a historic treaty to protect marine biodiversity. Hectic last-minute negotiations spilled over the deadline, but countries finalized the BBNJ or Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Treaty. It says governments must protect sea life beyond their marine territorial boundaries. But we are joined by D. Raghunandan from the All India People Science Network for more details on the implications. Raghu, thanks very much for joining us. Raghu, can you tell us what are the objectives of this treaty? This treaty is the third uh, what's called implementation treaty under the UN Convention of the Law of the Seas, UNCLOS. Uh, and the idea of this, which has been brewing now for close to two decades, is to declare some areas of international waters, that is, waters beyond national jurisdictions. Every country has a land border, and beyond that has a border which it uh, is considered its own territorial waters. So waters beyond that, which are considered the high seas, that is what is governed by this convention. And the idea is because these are the high seas, they are not governed by the laws of any country. They are in fact not governed by any laws at all. And right. till now, it was a kind of free for all. So what this treaty seeks to do is to uh, conserve roughly half of these uh, waters which are beyond territorial uh, waters by the year 2030. Uh, it's believed that about 60 odd percent of the world's oceans are uh, high seas. And this treaty therefore uh, aims at conserving half of this or 30 percent of the total oceans. So it's called in many uh, fora, it's called the 30-30 agreement. That is, you'll conserve 30% of the world's oceans by the year 2030. Right. Raghu, what does it mean for those who are commercially exploiting the high seas and, uh, and, and you know, commercially exploiting in different ways? Yes. So we, uh, in the territorial, in the waters beyond national jurisdiction, uh, which are the high seas, uh, there are three main problems uh, facing those waters. Uh, one is overfishing. There is no control over fishing, so people go in and catch whatever they can, and this is known to be resulting in species uh, loss and perhaps even threatening the existence of some species, leading even to fears of extinction of endangered uh, species, such as sharks, fins, and other uh, uh, such overfished uh, uh, species. Then there is the question of an emerging area now, which is mining the sea floor, right. looking for minerals and uh, uh, other such uh, things, which are industrially useful. Now, this is just starting. Uh, some advanced countries have the technology and the financial resources to engage in this kind of uh, uh, exploration first and then mining later. And if mining starts, the worry is that you will start digging up the ocean floor, you will throw up the mud from there, you will uh, damage the entire ecosystem uh, in that place and again result in species loss if uh, this is not controlled. So under this uh, treaty, it's not very clear what exactly will be done to control this. But the idea is that as the implementation proceeds, gradually either quotas will be prescribed or some areas will be prohibited 
for uh, fishing, which of course will be resisted by many countries. Uh, and the undersea mining will be regulated. And one of the concrete measures envisaged under this treaty is impact uh, environmental impact assessments, uh, okay. which would be made mandatory later, but initially at least to start doing some impact assessments and seeing how they influence commercial activity gradually and hopefully leading to maybe even prohibition of mining in particularly sensitive areas. The fact that this is a treaty mean, uh, Raghu, that it's legally binding on the countries that sign it? You see, there is actually no legal binding for any such international treaty, including COP15. Uh, like if a country does not uh, uh, stand by its uh, uh, contribution which has been promised under the Paris Agreement to reduce emissions by, let us say, 50%. Nobody can take them to court over it. The, quest, the whole question of which court has jurisdiction internationally is still open. As you know, the United States does not recognize any court uh, in the world, even though it drags people from various countries to various courts in The Hague, etc., for uh, uh, unnamed crimes against humanity and so on. But the US does not consider itself subject to any of these. In fact, the United States is not even a signatory to UNCLOS. Uh, it has participated in all the discussions. It has helped formulate uh, the rules, but it has not ratified uh, the treaty. Because according to the Republicans in Congress and in the Senate who have opposed this uh, consistently throughout, they say that UNCLOS hands over the ownership of the seas to the United Nations, which is a big no-no in the U.S. because the U.S. must have uh, its say and there must be so-called freedom of navigation everywhere and they don't want to recognize anybody else's uh, jurisdiction. So these issues are a bit open. They are not legally binding, but the hope is that like in the climate uh, treaty, the force of public opinion and the opinion of governments will lead to uh, obedience of these uh, laws. Although we know that that does not happen universally. Right, Raghu. And thanks very much for joining us. Following French military exits from Burkina Faso and earlier Mali in West Africa, countries are shaping their ties anew. It's been a tumultuous decade in Mali and Burkina Faso with popular unrest against French military presence. Public discontent also led to the ouster of the government in neighboring Guinea. Tanupriya Singh from People's Dispatch has been following this issue. She joins us now with the latest developments and how they are being seen in the region. Tanupriya, thanks for joining us. It's good to have you on Daily Debrief. So, Tanupriya, the statement which you mentioned in your write-up on People's Dispatch, which basically talks about regional integration, South-South cooperation, this is something that Burkina Faso and Mali have talked about. What are the other details of the developments? Can you just bring us up to speed? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, as you mentioned, uh, this whole part of or this uh, point of regional integration and cooperation was actually the result of a meeting held between Mali's interim prime minister uh, when he visited Burkina Faso at the end of uh, February. So uh, one of the key points was this commitment to the Bama, bamako Wagadougou access. And uh, both delegations, of both prime ministers spoke extensively about matters of greater cooperation in terms of economic uh, matters, in terms of security and defense. Um, and the meeting itself just comes weeks after foreign ministers from Mali, Burkina Faso, and Guinea. So these are all West African states located in the Sahel region, which is this belt that runs um, just below the Sahara Desert. Um, so all the foreign ministers from these three countries met and they proposed the bamako konakri Wagadougou strategic access. So they wanted to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, cooperation ranging from issues of trade, uh, rail and roadway links, uh, the supply of electricity and again they reiterated this issue of security 
So uh, these meetings have taken place in the context of some major developments in all three countries since 2020, namely military coups. So we've had two coups in Mali, we've had one in Guinea and two in Burkina Faso just last year. So um, the coups themselves took place uh, in part due to rising sort of anger and unrest, both in, in the public, but in general against the continued presence of France in the country particularly military presence. So France is already a call, it's a, it's a former colonial power. Uh, and then it continues to have military presence in these countries. And um, right. France had intervened in the Sahel region in 2013. And then again, and throughout um, till now under successive military uh, operations, seemingly to sort of deter um, armed conflict that was engulfing large parts of these West African countries. But what has happened is that um, France's present has been largely perceived as a failure um, it has failed to sort of respond to armed conflict, some 40% of Burkina Faso's territory is out of the government's control. So um, not only was France's presence considered a failure, but more than that, um, even the governments of Mali and the people of Mali construed its presence as actively sort of inflaming the conflict. So, for instance, in 2022, Mali actually approached the Security Council saying that, you know, France is carrying out acts of hostility and destabilization. It's actually aiding these um, quote unquote jihadist rebels, these groups. Um, so there was a lot of anger. And then you have these military coups. Um, and then in May 2022, uh, the current head of Mali's interim sort of military junta government, Asini Goita, led a coup. And uh, sorry, he led the coup prior, but in May 2022, he basically ordered France's troops to leave the country. And then in 2023, we have Burkina Faso doing the same. Um, France leaves Mali after nearly a decade of, of military presence. So um, a lot of this, and then you have the withdrawal of Fran uh, France from Burkina Faso, February 19th, or uh, the weekend of February 18th and 19th, Burkina Faso officially announces the end to France's military operations. Um, so while some of these countries have ousted French troops, they're still con uh, confronted with uh, with armed conflict, um, civilians killed, uh, government forces killed uh, in a series of attacks in the past weeks and months. So that issue, this uh, very complex and multi-layered issue of armed conflict, which doesn't adhere to very neatly to um, these uh, national or territorial borders, which are themselves quite can be quite arbitrary in many senses. So there is this a uh, continuation of armed conflict, which in turn puts more pressure on these military leaders who came to power sort of on the promise of dealing with this issue. So um, even uh, even this has happened, even as this has happened, so now uh, see Mali, for instance, there, there have been reports that Mali has turned to Russia to seek some sort of military assistance. And um, even in, for instance, the 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 communique, the communique that was issued by the foreign ministers, they sort of, um, and I'm quoting directly, they reaffirmed their commitment to examine any partnership that respects their sovereignty and responds to the needs of their population. So they're trying to branch right. out and seek these alternatives. So one of them could be Russia. The other, which we're seeing in the region, is through this um, the strategic access that they're proposing. Tanupia, can you also give us the regional significance, how this is being received in the region? Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think another key part of this, uh, a context, a key a part of the context for this is the exclusion of these countries from the regional blocs, particularly the Economic Community of West African States or ECOWAS. Um, the, the, this organization proceeded to uh, impose major sanctions, especially on Mali. There was a trade embargo. There was a border closure, which for Mali is a landlocked country and it is heavily import dependent. So there was that, that sparked protests. Um, so regionally, now that these countries are moving towards unification in the context of this exclusion from ECOWAS, even from the African Union for that matter, um, ECOWAS in February again rejected a request by these three countries to lift the suspension so they could be let back in. Um, that was rejected clearly. So now that they're moving towards this, uh, this has been welcomed. So uh, in the story that I wrote, I spoke to Kafui Kansanaya from the West Africa People's Organization. It's this anti-imperialist network that was formed in December. So they have really welcomed this initiative and actually sort of gone forward to call for and to advocate for greater unity, for great uh, informed by pan-Africanism, greater unity across the continent to um, sort of deal with these issues, um, to deal with these issues of uh, security, uh, of armed conflict. Um, but even beyond that, I mean, uh, France's military, uh, sorry, France's influence and presence on Africa is not just in terms of boots on the ground, um, especially in West Africa, especially in Francophone countries, it continues to exhibit, uh, exert great forms of control uh, to the sea if a frank through the fact that French companies have been mining minerals from these countries for decades. Um, so in the context of all of that, uh, so that is still ongoing. 
Um, and then, you know, uh, as we're talking, friend, the French president has just wrapped up his visit right. to four Central African countries. And prior to that, he organized, uh, he announced this um, sort of reorganization of France's military presence without really going into um, a vid uh, talking about the withdrawal of troops or actually shutting down its bases. So there's, the, uh, there's that ambiguity, but also this... Um, continued imperialist forms of control that France still continues to exert, which, which has led to the president's remarks being led with a lot of skepticism. And it's also the reason that the organizations like West Africa People's Organization, they're advocating for greater unity, not just in terms of defense, but in terms of economy. Um, they've, they've sort of lent their support to this initiative taken up by Mali, Burkina Faso and Guinea, um, while also advocating for a, and I'm here quoting directly for me, for a popular uh, process for a process led by the people and formed by the principles of anti-imperialism, self-reliance and peaceful development. So, um, you know, as, as we see uh, over, the, over, over the coming months and, year, uh, and the year even, um, Mali and Burkina Faso had agreed to a civilian transition plan, which led to some of the sanctions, ECOWAS agreeing to lift some sanctions. Right. So uh, Mali has already introduced a new constitution, I believe, a couple of days back, which is uh, set, was, was supposed to be set to a public referendum on 19th March, but I mean, it remains to be seen if that is even possible. Um, right, so to see these sort of processes playing out over the next uh, few months and year, I think it's really important to see uh, what sort of these kind of alternative forms of regional unity that these countries are advocating. Thanks a lot for joining us. World number one tennis star Novak Djokovic is out of the draw for Indian Wells and Miami Open because he never got vaccinated for COVID-19. He wanted special permission for the ATP Masters events, but it has been denied. He won't get a visa for events scheduled in the United States in March. But it seems new rules that kick in about a month later would have allowed him to enter the U.S. unvaccinated. Siddhant Ane, sports journalist, joins us over video conference with some details of this. So, Siddhant, what does this mean? He can't play until May, but he, he, he can play after that even if he's unvaccinated what are the rules here it's hard it's hard to know uh Pragya, what might happen after may 11th which is uh the date on which the u.s is supposed to end uh its covid19 emergency so we are assuming that the idea that the u.s government has is to open up the economy uh, and the country completely i mean to well we can discuss how completely uh, separately but uh, but at least to people who have visas and 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 are able to come in by regular means, uh, so the whole point, I guess, of removing the emergency is to remove some of these restrictions on travel as well. Uh, there are already unvaccinated, high-profile athletes within the United States who uh, are being allowed to compete in their various sports. Uh, I think the most uh, high-profile would be. Uh, Kyrie Irving, who is a superstar in the National Basketball uh, NBA. Uh, so for Novak Djokovic, the, the saga, I suppose, continues and he's sticking to his guns as he has from the beginning about getting vaccinated, uh, which goes to show how deeply sort of entrenched this idea of uh, absolute individual uh, liberty is uh, with, with, with some of these people who can afford it. Uh, because, you know, as much as... Uh, he loses out on what he might earn from doing well at this tournament, as well as the appearance fee that he'll pick up when he attends. Uh, sponsors also lose out because if the top ranked player in the world decides not to show up for your tournament, right. that of course, has, an, has a commercial impact on the entire event uh, as a whole. So I'm sure there will be pressure. Uh, there is lobbying, of course, in the United States. And among that will be... Uh, those who believe that vaccination is not essential and, and not actually in the public good, not important for public health, uh, will and who see commercial benefits from it, will be pushing the government to remove restrictions. That is what, uh, what we can imagine. He's not attended these tournaments since 2019, uh, uh, so it's, it's been a while. Uh, and for someone who is aging in some senses, uh, at least in terms of the clock, maybe not what he does on court, uh, but it's, uh, you know, win-loss kind of situation. It keeps him fresher and, and you know, le less fatigued when it comes to the big tournaments because 
for these guys, the big prize are the four Grand Slam tournaments. Uh, so those are the main uh, sort of focal points of the calendar year. Um, and uh, I'm sure Djokovic is also planning for Paris uh, Olympics uh, next year, which will, would be the big one for him, uh, definitely. And where there are likely to be no restrictions already, the French Open does not have similar uh, visa requirements. So, so he can compete uh, in, in France and in other parts of the world. But the US has held on to this policy. I guess his lawyers also have a fair point uh, because there's a large population of unvaccinated people in the US going about most of their business uh, as though the pandemic uh, never happened. Right. So if, if that is your take on, on certain things, then on other things, how can you hold on to these restrictions? It's kind of contradictory in a way, uh, but you know it, it is what it is. Right, Siddhant. And thanks a lot for joining us with that. Anytime. That's a wrap for today. Thank you for watching. We'll be back with another episode of Daily Debrief tomorrow. You can read our stories on peoplesdispatch.org and find our regular updates on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.